and it looks like we are live at Star Scale Grow episode seven with Adam Beck. Adam, lovely to have you here. Good day. This podcast is for people who are hiring, for people who are trying to get hired. It's talking about the, the challenge of recruiting for startup businesses, for businesses that are scaling, and even businesses that are established. Um, super happy to have you here for this episode. I thought. We've we've had the the opinions of a couple of recruiters. We've had the opinions of um, of, of a couple of people on on the other side. And I thought having an engineer's perspective on this challenge of of hiring and getting hired, and you've been on the actual recruiting sure. as well internally. So uh, I thought it might be a, a a good a good conversation. I think we've got some some interesting things to work through. Did you want to just take thirty sure. seconds and introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, but uh, yeah, 30 seconds to introduce myself. Yeah, I'm a senior lead at a company called Center Group, but they own uh, Westfield here in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and uh, so I look after engineers there, but I also um, I also run my own like software engineering uh, mentoring company. Um, it's called 688 Technologies, and it's a, a service that's like specifically targeted at helping software engineers through interviews, um, learn to check out new technologies and, and things like that as well. Nice. Perfect. Thank you, my friend. And we had the very good fortune, probably better fortune for me than you, of working together at Zendesk, <laughs> I was going to say about 30,000 years ago, but I think about, about yeah. five years uh, time. That was wonderful. It, it was. It was, uh, it was wonderful for me too. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's, let's make a start. Sure. Let's, let's start off with the, the really tricky questions. Why, why is it when okay. you go on LinkedIn, everybody has such a strong opinion about recruiting? Oh, wow. Uh, well, I mean, like, every, everyone has opinions, whether they're correct or not, or, you know, valuable. <laughs> I think, why is it? You know, I think, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure why people have such strong opinions, but part of it could be that, you know, people like to be treated in lots of different ways. And, you know, a, a recruitment process is probably like more of a reflection of the people running the company or the people that are involved in the hiring process. And, you know, it, it could be an extension of their personalities. And sometimes people's personalities just don't rub up against one another well. And so I think, you know, everyone, everyone wants to do it their own way and thinks they can, you know, do it better. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I think, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure why, but maybe in your experience, like, why do you think, like, is there something spicy that you've come across and uh, yeah. why everyone? Yeah. I mean, look, I think it's, uh, I think, you know, dis despite LinkedIn's data saying that um, average job tenure at the moment is, I think, sort of 1.6 years, I think for a lot of mm -hmm. people, moving jobs is actually a really big deal. It's quite an emotional thing at times here. Yeah. Sometimes totally. you're yeah, potentially leaving a, a team that you really like or a company that you really like. Totally. And and I, and I think to, to to a degree, it's sometimes up there, you know, with, with, with moving house and dropping the kids off at school for the first time. It's like one of those sort of quite emotional yeah. things. Whenever you, whenever, whenever there's mo emotion involved in something, we run the risk of not always being as rational as as, as we'd like to like to think we are. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And, and I think it's emotional you know, on both sides. I mean, I think one of the things is that with with, with hiring and, and, and interviewing, particularly, like nobody wants to be there. You know. Yeah. People wish they didn't have to interview for a job. They wish they already had the job. They wish they hadn't got made redundant. They wish they hadn't um, had to move. Yeah. On job or, or whatever i think on the mm -hmm. hiring side hiring managers wish that that person hadn't left or or that it yeah. wasn't just such a, such a big impact on, on their day jobs um so nobody really wants to be there and everyone seems to be like making the the, the, the best of a kind of a, a tricky situation and something yeah. that's almost again interviews i think they're, they're this thing that we try to we ask people to try and be as as rational and normal in a very abnormal situation like this fourth kind of discussion. absolutely yeah no that's exactly that's yeah that's exactly it like you know people they tell you to be yourselves and uh, be yourself in an interview but that's like the most unnatural experience that like you have like 45 minutes or like an hour and a half whatever it is like this hyper like pressurized situation where you have to be yourself but you also have to sell yourself mm -hmm. and like people uh, have you know uh 
as I found that like uh, the more people I mentor that like people have often have a lot of self-defeating beliefs about themselves and they're like, I don't want to be myself. No fucking way. Sorry. No way. And, you know? And so they try and be this version of themselves that they're mm-hmm. trying to sell to these yeah. people. And it makes it more, uh, makes it more weird or more difficult as well. And I mean, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of like, you know, there's a lot of emotions wrapped up in, of recruitment and hiring and going to jobs and yeah I, I can like just drawing on my own personal experience like the times where i've left jobs i've most often not wanted to but i've needed to because i want to learn new things or i need to look for a better environment or um those types of things so i'm always like i'm always leaving people that i really want to work with and so yeah. there's an element of like you know new exciting job but it kind of sucks as well mm-hmm. yeah and I think sort of moving on from that. So you've you've been through interview processes and worked for some mm. some pretty big name companies. Obviously, we worked at Zendesk, you. and, you'd, and I know you've been involved in hiring at, at Zendesk as well, being on interview panels. Yeah. What, and I'm not asking you to name names and point fingers or anything like that, but I'm, I'm interested. Like, what 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 things stand out as as being really positive in in some interviewing or hiring processes you've been through? Yeah. And, and what do you think needs improving? Yeah, good question. Um, actually, yeah, drawing on my time at Zendesk specifically, like I remember my interview that I had there, and it was like the stand at the time it was like the standard like San Francisco tech interview type of thing where after doing like you have your phone screen and then you have your take home tech test which was timed as well, and then you had your on site which went for like three or four hours. Um, and you get like a half hour break in there. Um, but the first, uh, technical interview that I had was with uh, a senior engineer at the time and then became like a manager. He's moved on and stuff like that. But that particular interview, like he was so incredibly friendly and welcoming in the interview. Like he, he didn't communicate explicitly, but how he dealt with the situation, like he kind of cut through the, the noise that's in interviews where like you're trying to posture and market yourself. It wasn't until after I was hired at Zendesk and then worked with him in interviews as well, that like the stereotypical approach to interviews is that when someone's being interviewed, you're looking for reasons not to hire them. You're looking for faults. Whereas he approached it very explicitly and that like, I'm looking for reasons to hire you. I'm looking for positive signifiers. And like at the time, at that point in my career, that was like, it's someone like flipped on a light in a room. It totally changed my perspective on it. Yeah. Yeah. And that was really influential. Yeah, it's and it's 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 funny to say that because I think that's that's been been mine and, and our philosophy for, for for a long time as well is you know particularly when we we we're hiring for new clients or we're working with with new companies and I think it's this mm. common thing isn't it, right where um, you can yeah. share a profile of of a, of a candidate that you've screened and you know sometimes like a, a message on Slack or an email from from a hiring manager will be yeah looks good but this 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 and yeah that. and you can default them to things that they don't like. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 i agree i think you know my time at zendesk as well i sort of got more and more um exposure to to people who genuinely thought like this mm-hmm. i don't know part of me sort of thinks that you know there's sometimes we lose fact sight of the fact that you know, hiring is a privilege right to be Absolutely. able to yeah into business have have a degree of say over someone's next step in their career have a degree Absolutely. of influence over the, the team, something that you bring into a team. It's, it's a privilege. I, I, I think sometimes we, 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 the industry, lose lose sight of that fact. Mm-hmm. And it's it's very easy to to think of hiring as just this purely transactional thing, which is why I think it's default to this is what I don't like, this is what I don't like. That's what I mean. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, again, he hit the nail on the head. Like people, um, like if you're not, if it's not like a small team, if it's like a large company, you're just kind of like in the, uh, like a cog in the process of hiring someone, you forget that like, you know, this person's applied because they want the job because they you know, want to keep the lights on at home or they want to, you know, or this is like the next step in their career. Like they want this experience and it's yeah a very emotive thing for them. Um, yeah. yeah, it is a privilege. Absolutely. And I think this this human the human side of it as well. I think you know in there's there's this thing of you know we want we want people who share our vision and share you know our values and all that. And I and I totally get that. And I I think we should always be sure. want to hire for that. But I think when we go out looking for these overt signals of why somebody wants to join us, yeah. 
as opposed to you know what sometimes people just need a job and they'd like to work somewhere where they get treated well and get paid get paid fairly it's yeah, just being made absolutely life should be made redundant you've gone from two incomes to one you just need a job yep. and you need a job soon um expecting yeah. that person to be all you know, <laughs> yeah oh, look at me when they just want a job yeah that's so it. again I, I i think part of that is on is on the recruiters in initial screening and discussions like why, yeah, why sure. you, what's happening with you for work at the moment and an understanding yeah. drivers mm-hmm. and motives um and and reasons for for people applying um and then yeah. passing that to the hiring team this is the situation this is you know this you know this situation of this candidate because two candidates can have two different reasons for applying right so that's why totally I think yeah this more human approach is important so yeah Things that are positive that, that people do well, look for reasons why you should hire someone as opposed to why you shouldn't. What are the things that you think overall, and again, not asking you to point fingers, that, that needs improvement? Uh, that needs improvement, yeah. I think I think having more space in interviews for vulnerability would, or just in the, in the industry or just like at work in general would be, is, would be like a huge step up because like you're, like what you were saying before in terms of like we expect like this person to come in and like they have like perfect alignment with like these arbitrary company values and uh you know those sorts of things and of course company values can be like a good signifier for the types of people you want to attract but like i like i don't think i've ever read company values on a website and be like man that sounds like me like i've never aligned my personality with like a corporate entity or like a, a like a capitalist entity before i'd much rather align myself with the people that i'm working with or the people that have leadership positions over me and i think <clears throat> i think like it's uh, it's a push and pull on both sides and that like candidates um should feel more comfortable to to be vulnerable in an an interview and like you know if someone asks like hey like why are you looking for a job or you know what's the deal and they can be like look you know my partner was just made redundant and we've gone down to um you know one uh, from two to one incomes and i need a bit of a bump or or i just got made redundant and this sounds like an interesting opportunity or it could be the situation where they actually like you know this sounds uh like a banger position you know let me let me in and then vice versa, the people interviewing as well, like taking taking the extra time to in, uh, ensure that there is space for people to, to be vulnerable and make it like not weird. Like a, a, a particular technique that like I've used in the past is to uh, like front load that at the start of the interview and like a- acknowledge that like, this is really weird. We're gonna sit here for like 45 minutes and I recognize that like I'm in a position of power and I don't want to grill you too much and it's okay to like sweat or like stumble. I'm not going to, you know, if it's like a whiteboard, like uh, assure them that I'm not grading them on like how they draw. I'm more interested in talking to them and understanding that they're uh, like a culture ad or a nice person rather than that they're like the best engineer that I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, And I think that's, I, I, I love that approach. And I think, you know, having empathy for the, the situation and the other person as well. Again, this, yeah. this unusual environment, this forced environment where you ask people to be natural. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I, I agree. I, th- I think that's a lovely approach. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you've always had pretty positive sort of response to that or feedback from that from the people you've interviewed. Yeah. I mean, like uh, just on a base level, like it makes people feel more comfortable, but then like you as the interviewer get more of an insight of who they actually are rather than this, like this can do attitude person. You, you get to see like how they actually behave and you get more signifiers of reasons to hire them or why they might not be the best fit for, you know, that position. Yeah. And, and when you frame it like that, it kind of sounds logical, doesn't it? Make people feel really comfortable so they can be themselves. Cause that way you'll get to see That's it. Really are and be able to make some decisions on whether you think they're worth pursuing it further. You know, that's it. Like the extra like fifteen minutes that takes to do that to like find some commonality um, with someone and be like, you know, oh, like you know, you up in the background, um, like up in the background, I see like some Dungeons and Dragons books, or like I see some weights in the background, and like chat about that, make them feel comfortable. That extra fifteen minutes is like in terms of like return on investment is the return on investment is so high because you end up with the right people in uh, in those positions in compared to like the extra 15 minutes that you get back in your day like whatever that equates to and like whatever you're getting paid it's the 
yeah, the scales are so far in the other direction that you should be like kind and compassionate and, and have a lot of empathy just to make sure that everything aligns ahead of time before you accidentally get someone into a position that doesn't align with what they want, doesn't align with what you want for the company and all that sort of stuff. Cause that'll, that'll waste a lot more time than 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree. And I think that's a, a brilliant way of looking at the ROI that you get that versus the 15 minutes you get back at your work out your hourly rate. Well, there's no, there's absolutely yeah. no comparison. Thank you. That's brilliant. I love that. So we talked about sort of, you know, what, what, what companies could do better. What, what, what do you think engineers can, and we'll talk about engineers because because you're from an engineering background. What do you think engineers mm -hmm. could do better in interviews? What what advice do you give people? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like yeah, I'll I'll avoid banging on about the you know vulnerability and empathy uh, stuff. But I think like on uh, on like a base level, I think I think asking more questions that aren't related to like a tech stack and stuff like that. I think because. It, depending on the types of companies that you're joining, like if you're joining like, you know, the Atlassians or the Zendesks now and, and that sort of stuff, like the likelihood of the tech stack changing is like very, um, very unlikely because they're very embedded in how they do things. But if you're joining like a, a smaller, medium sized company, because just because of the tech stack, it's likely to change. Like someone's probably going to bring some new tech in or use some different tools. And if all your questions are kind of, focused around like are you using ruby or elixir or can i use um can i use kubernetes instead of lambdas or serverless stuff um then it's uh like inevitably in like about a year's time you're probably not going to be enjoying it as much and mm. i think like uh, as engineers and someone that like uh, and people that will likely have like uh, you know uh, lots of jobs over the course of their career i think you owe it to yourself a little bit you owe it, to your, owe it to yourself to do a little bit more digging into why you'd want to join that company. And like, you're stuck with these people for like, you know, seven and a half, eight hours a day, you might as yeah. well like them and have a good time with them. Yeah. I think so. Asking more questions about the company or what it's like to, to work with the team that you're going into or who the leadership is and how they make decisions under pressure or, um, yeah. given a certain situation, where would they go? Um, cause it is, those are the inflection points like at, at jobs that matter the most when like leadership needs to make the decision between, you know, hiring the extra person or promoting, you know, two or three people or doing more, um, technical cleanup work or deep technical work versus, uh, the eight features they want to get out in the next three months. Like those are the things that matter most. Mm. Yeah, and that's a great way of looking at it. And I think that that kind of segues nicely into uh, – I've lost track of the amount of times where um, I've, I've been rejected by by candidates I've approached, people I've approached about roles, and mm. they ask about the tech stack, and I tell them, and they go, oh, no, it sounds a bit old, and no, I'm not interested in working in that. Yeah. I, I think there's – again, to, to, use your, um, to use your words, I think people owe it to themselves to – to focus on being really good problem solvers and, yep. and, and you know, at fixing business problems through technology rather than just always wanting to work on the next shiny thing. And I think that's why yep. we see some some cohorts of engineers doing a year here, a year there, a year there because they're chasing work on the shiny, shiny things rather yeah. than focusing on being good problem solvers, good teammates, um, good mentors to juniors. Um, I, mm -hmm. I think there's a risk in that. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, like the yeah, like why yeah, why people shy away from like older tech stacks or why they kind of jump from like job to job each year. I think the like there's a like it's a normal it's a normal behavior to kind of like see like new or um not as old and think better. Like you know, yeah. more you know, a little bit of this thing was good, a lot of it must be really good. Um mm -hmm. and often like that's not the case in life like uh, things often exist on a spectrum and the the most ideal situations typically sit in the middle of that and i think uh like as an industry and as like engineers as like a part of the industry i think oh i should uh, no I'll walk that back a little bit i think SaaS engineers mm -hmm. especially that exist in terms of like making like apis and websites and like mm -hmm. new services and that type of thing we exist on like the outer not outer edges but almost like the bleeding edge of like tech like there's so much more to programming than like making websites and 
and uh, like SaaS stuff. There's a whole mm-hmm. world of like people that uh, in their day to day use like low level languages like C plus plus or like you know Java or whatever it might be. And like our portion of the industry will look at that and be like, like that's, you know, that's Mm -hmm. old or like that's, that's wild. You have to deal with like these particular technologies or pointers or like whatever it is. But there's often, because those things have existed for such a long time, there's often like heaps of experience, lots Mm -hmm. of knowledge and lots of carryover between the different parts of our industry. And I think like there's, it's, it's not respect for those things, but understanding and a willingness to learn from them that like, Like, you know, I, I like uh, I was recently I got drawn into a conversation with someone talking about PHP recently. And like if you mention PHP to any like SaaS, yeah, exactly. They'll start laughing and be like, yeah, get out of here with PHP. But the thing is, like the the people that exist in the PHP community that are, you know, doing well and, you know, develop with like modern practices and stuff like that, you know, they got photos of them like driving Lambos and like having very secure, very okay lifestyles. Um, and it's written on like this language and like these frameworks that people consider like, you know, old and crusty and dusty and all this sort of stuff. I think, yeah, people are really quick to, to judge like old technologies and kind of shy away from them. But then also, like you're saying, they'll, they'll quickly jump from job to job chasing, a tech stack or a particular new thing that's come out. And in terms of like developing skills over the course of your career, you'll get a lot more out of like staying at a particular job for even like two years or three years and become a better problem solver because you're forcing yourself into these constraints. Like presumably it's not like a toxic culture or anything like that, but yeah. Yeah. And and, and there's a reason things like PHP and Java have been around forever, right? They bro. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's not going away. No, like the rusts and, and, and the nodes and all this of the world, like th- there's always going to be evolution. There's always going to be the next thing, but 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 some of these things stick around for a while. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think there's, there, there's potentially as much professional satisfaction, if that's the right phrase, of, of doing sure. work that's, that's like breaking down a monolithic, piece of architecture into into microservices and, and migrating and cutting over there's as much yeah. satisfaction you can get out of doing that to a platform or to a, to a, to a, a business that then allows it mm-hmm. to scale and do all the fancy things it wants to do than there is of building you know uh, the next you know platform where you just basically plugging in a whole bunch of ais and microservices um and you know yeah a- absolutely i think you know the a business will get more or uh, it'll look better on like an engineer's resume and a business will get more out of an engineer that would work on like breaking down the monolith or improving their existing code base. You know, do it like people call it like, you know, brownfield development instead of greenfield, like doing brownfield development and that type of thing will get you so much further in your career than like hopping between jobs where you get to do greenfield development. Cause it with existing code bases, you get to, involve yourself with the intricacies of working with code that was written a certain way because of a really strange constraint, or you get to work with people that have existed in the domain for ages, but you also get to understand like scale and, and all that sort of stuff. And it's, it's just things you typically don't get when you work with greenfield projects. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Talking of, of, uh, of hiring then, what, what can we do about mm. coding? Tests? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the the recruiting world and the engineering world seems to be sort of divided. You know, some people don't want to do them. They you know, just interview me, and if you're not a technical interviewer, then I don't even want to you know, speak with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Some people, you know, I, yes, yes, I'll do your coding test, but you're fifth in line because all these other companies that I've spoken to before you have sent me theirs as well. So I'll get I'll get to your yeah. coding test in a week's time. I've experienced that more times than I care to remember. Um, yeah online platforms and you know stat ranking candidates based on based mm. on their results you know great in theory and a whole bunch of good stuff out of it but when you don't have any control over the environment that someone's doing that test in you've got kids running around and they've made a promise to yeah. get it to you by such and such a time and they get kids that are sick and wives had to work a double shift and all of a sudden they're trying to do a coding challenge in amongst you know family mayhem you know, that you're going to yeah. probably get a result of someone who is single and has all the time in the world to do it and can do it in peace and quiet. So you know, there, there's pros and cons for all of these things, but what, 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 what do you think we can do about them? What, how does that evolve? 
Yeah. I, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any one like perfect answer, um, to, um, to coding challenges or like better interview processes. But I think, I think making your interview process is like as accessible as possible is probably the best, like putting, like puts your best foot forward. And that like, if you're genuinely interested in attracting a di- uh, like a diverse set of candidates, whether that's single parents, uh, parents with multiple kids or um, immigrants or like whoever it might be, then having options uh, available to them is yeah. the best way to go. And like, if you don't have the resources as a company to provide those options, then like, that's okay. But you need to acknowledge that, you know, that's not going to attract the most diverse candidate pool. And if that's not a priority for you because you don't have the resources, then that like make that decision and, and be, you know, you don't have to call it out in your interview process, but you like acknowledge that it's a thing. And if it's important to you, you'll make the time for it. Like a, 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 I've been through a couple interview processes previously where I've had the choice of like a take home test or like a, a coding challenge, like in person. Yeah. And like, it's that that's excellent. Cause I know me like interviews for me, are like a very sweaty ordeal. And so I know that I'll excel with a take home coding test. Cause I'll be able to like, I'm able to squirrel away for like an hour before bed, um, across a couple nights or you know, early in the morning, instead of going to the gym to, to do those things. Whereas some people that don't have those uh, luxuries will, you know, they would prefer the in-person one because they can excel in that environment. That's a good approach that I've seen previously. Yeah. I, and, and I love that as well. And, and I think, you know, I, I think the reason maybe not, or I think the reason more businesses don't do that is because I don't think enough, do enough planning around their hiring. Um, yeah. Anyone who knows me will, will be sick of me saying good hiring comes from good planning. So I like, imagine like, <laughs> love it. But being able to involve your team, for example, um, yeah, if you know, if if they're going to be involved potentially in in, in a face to face or even like a, a video mm-hmm. um, based coding challenge, you know, who's available, what times have they got, get get them to to place hold that in their in their in their calendars, and then give yeah. give Adam the options. Hey, you can. We've got these times available. We've got Mary and, and Peter, and we've got Josephine and George, like two different mm-hmm. pairs. They've got these times available, or you can do something you take home, or or if you want to do do an online platform one, you can do that too. You know what's going to work yeah. best for you? How do, how do we get to see see the best of you and the best of your coding ability? You know, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I think that kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier, and like providing those options to people it gives you an opportunity to look for reasons to hire people again. Like I think. Yeah, and involving your team in the whole process as well. Like it's a it's a win win. You, you skill up the people that you're working with. Yeah. But inevitably, like you, the the people that are interv- interviewing the people coming in, or yeah, you know, it's a diverse, more diverse set of people doing it. Yeah, it's a win win. Yeah, I mean, again, to, to to use your your language, the ROI you get from involving your team is yeah. is, is by not in just the ability to make the best hiring decisions, but your, your team's learning more about interviewing and about themselves as well, um, about how to how to better describe the team, describe the company, you know, focus on you know, how, how do we interview, like what are our interview questions like, yeah. Yeah. But also being able to spread the workload amongst your team. Imagine if you're a hiring manager and you, you had a team of 10 and they're all competent interviewers. Suddenly the pressure's mm-hmm. not just on you as the hiring manager. To be to be running absolutely everything, but you can distribute the work out. Absolutely, collaborative decision making, and it's not all on you. The pressure isn't all on you. Yeah, the amount of hiring managers I've, I've I've met who who go, you know, the next two weeks are crazy for me. I'm doing back to back interviews, and I, and I I said I go, oh yeah, that must be challenging. And I think why don't you just get get your team more involved? Like it, it seems yeah. logical. Man, that's, <laughs> that's so. it and like getting getting your team involved as well like ha- it provides like a signifier to your team that you trust them with the company yeah. and yeah. so it's just like it's a positive echo chamber that you create in that like um, it's a signifier to your employees that you trust them they have a little bit of stewardship over how the company's being built um, they feel more comfortable yeah it's a yeah it's a no-brainer and it's a shame when people don't do that like they feel like they have to steer the ship and be in control mm-hmm. And, and that's the word, isn't it? I think it's control. Like people like, like we like yeah. to feel like we have control over things. But again, this, this, I'm going to be using that all day now. The ROI on on having this stuff happening is is is, is, is endless. 
what what do you think then is is like the ideal hiring process? I mean, I've I've, I've worked in companies where um, where they have you know mm. literally like one interview pro like one interview that's like the San Fran thing, like three or four hours of interviews. Yeah, like one session. I've 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 worked in companies of hired for companies that will do four or five different sessions that are shorter, and then they get one together. What What do you think is ideal? Yeah, good question. I think, yeah, it like, uh, whether fortunate or not, I've been through a lot of interview processes, like over the course of my career and that like, you know, I've been through, I've been through, yeah, like the San Fran style where it's, you know, three or four hours on one day. And then there's like another session that's like an hour and all this sort of stuff. But also I've been through shorter interview processes where it's been like, what's felt like one and a half interviews that it's like this, this like hour and a half and then maybe like 20 minutes after that. And I think it's somewhere like somewhere in the middle in that like like two to three steps i think for at least for the like the uh, software industry works really well like your first step you know could be like uh, a phone screener it's not, yeah something as light as like a phone screener or it could be a little bit heavier than that and maybe like a half hour 45 minute you know introduction interview and then some sort of technical test whether that's a system design interview where you're like using a mirror board or a whiteboard or something like that that's kind of honest about what you're building as and what i mean by honest is that um it it replicates what you're dealing with on a day-to-day basis like don't ask this you know poor person to do like you know to do bubble sort or to like make like a, a binary search tree or something like that like unless you're unless that's your day-to-day job but uh, whether it's like a, that type of interview, or if it's like a, a take home or like zoom coding challenge and in the middle, do that. And then at the end have like a, a final interview with like the hiring manager or people on the team and to ensure that there's like a culture ad and like an alignment there. And then at the end, like internally getting everyone together for yeses and nos really helps as well. Getting everyone's perspective. Cause often, you know, I'll pick up something totally different to the person next to me that, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't have ever noticed and having that perspective is you know, invaluable. And or, or, uh, some advice I got from <clears throat> a manager that I worked with a while ago at Zendesk, um, was that like, if you can't, if you can't imagine working with this person for the rest of your life, cause you know, hopefully you have a good job. You want to stay here for a long time. If you can't imagine working with this person for like a really, really long time, then you probably shouldn't. Yeah. And like, you know, like you're saying, it's the, the ROI on making that decision. If it's not like a hard yes, then it should probably be a no. It saves you a lot of headaches in the long run. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and conversely, I think the flip side of that is um, this saying of, you know, would they pass the pub test? You know, would you want to go for a client <laughs> yeah. for, for a year with this person? Well, 100%. Yeah. Often we don't like, we don't, we don't, we don't go for people for pints with with people that we don't share common interests with and all that sort of thing. So the, the pub test can sometimes be a little bit like, you know, you, sure. you're, you're, you're sort of heavily biasing people that you have commonalities with and all that sort of thing. So same totally. budget. Of- yeah, exactly. Like, you know, yeah, you, if you're going like the pub test or, you know, uh, those types of things, yeah, you'll end up with like a very homogenous team, everyone that looks exactly the same, talks the same. And yeah, that's not, that's not the most ideal situation at all. Like I think, yeah, when you're like going through a process, like finding, um, the finding joy in the differing opinions, whether it's someone that's like pushing back on, you know, like no, no, just trash because of X, Y, Z or whatever. Um, or some other like product based decision, like there's, that'll be far more valuable than, you know, old mate that thinks every idea that comes out of your mouth is the best. Yeah, I think and trying like I don't know the best way to do it, but optimizing for the those situations in a hiring process is I think is most ideal because I'd rather work for somewhere that has like a diverse set of opinions than everyone that thinks that you know every idea they have is you know the best thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, it's and I think you could wrap that all up. You know, in if you sort of go back to the beginning of this conversation, like why people have such strong opinions mm-hmm. about, about, about recruiting, um, the emotive side of it, but, but we, we all, we all have our own opinions about the workplace and the kind of people we want to work with and, and all that sort of thing. And I think these are all 
wrapped up. But I, but I think that when it comes down to it, recruiters and, and hiring teams, they need to own this process and be putting as much thought and care into into how they're interviewing yeah. as they do into why they wouldn't hire someone or what they don't like about a profile, you know? That's and again, this, this planning thing and being everyone being really clear about, you know, what does what does a good a good looking candidate look like in terms of skills, competencies, values, and what does a not not so an attractive person look like? So it's, it. it's 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 full of personal opinion, and and you know we're also the uh, the sum of all the lessons we've learned in the past and the experiences we've had in the past as well that we come to the front yeah. as well. Totally. What, what 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 are the sort of the, the common things that you're through your your other business where you're helping en- engineers? What what are the sort of common mm-hmm. themes or things that you that you're helping or, or questions that you're getting from engineers about hiring or about recruiting? Um, yeah, I guess from like I have a couple couple di- different like demographics, I guess for the uh, that I work with at the minute, like from like junior engineers and like career changers. It's mostly trying to understand what the interview process looks like at all because like even just talking to people in like different industries like our interview process for like tech is so like alien compared to like the mental health industry and that sort of stuff uh like my partner for example like she works in the mental health industry like counseling etc and like they have one interview that lasts for like an hour hour and a half and that's it and that's that's how they do it and which is sounds so bonkers to me uh that it wouldn't be a multi-stage interview so you can understand who this person is and all that sort of stuff and vice versa for her but yeah people that are changing careers they want to know like what's a system design interview like you know what what do i draw on the whiteboard or like what questions do i ask and then more senior engineers that i'm working with they're uh, looking at kind of like the the sharper edges of like how do I craft my resume in a particular way that is pointed towards these categories of jobs, yeah. but also like what projects can I take on in my own time that will help develop these skills and um, like people that are more experienced they're often looking for like project ideas and like accountability and ways to extend themselves kind of like, you know, to use it like a metaphor or analogy at the you know gym, like you, you don't want to do the same weights all the time. Cause then you're not going to progress. Like they're looking for ways to add on like, you know, 2.5 kilos each week. And they're looking for that in, in terms of like technology. And that's what I've helped a lot of uh, more senior engineers with. Nice. Perfect. But thank you so much. I'm mindful of time. Um, we said we might be about sure. half on. We're, we're getting closer to, to 40 minutes. Brilliant talking to you. I think uh, hopefully people who, who listen to this or watch this um, will will have got a, a fair bit out of it. And I think if people who are hiring have perhaps got some some thoughts or some, some useful info about how they can approach their own hiring, people who are interviewing maybe have got some thoughts around how they can go into interviews as well. Um, I think that is yeah. nothing but helpful. Thank you again. Absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, I'll oh, thank include you. your to your business and your profile in the comments uh, wherever we load this, so people can find you and if they want to talk to you oh, about amazing. it, you can do that too. Thank you so much, my thank friend. You. Absolute pleasure to have you. Take care. Catch ya. <laughs>